I want us to consider tonight, especially that line in the Catechism's answer, destroy the works of the devil and everything that raises itself up against you and every conspiracy against your word. I want us to reflect on that in terms of what we read in Psalm 139. We're going to read together the conclusion of Psalm 139. It's a psalm that's well-known and well-loved, but it's not well-loved for the section that we're going to read tonight. It's important for us to understand what is being said in these words. Psalm 139, beginning at verse 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. If there's anything that you don't want to be today, it's a hater. Hater is a term that people use a lot in our society to describe those who are judgmental, to describe those who are critical, who are cranky, who are obnoxious, who are disapproving, who are argumentative. What do haters do? Well, haters going to hate, 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 hate. That's a line that's tailor-made. And some of you are swift enough to recognize the illusion. As parents, my wife and I would sometimes cringe when our boys would use the word hate. I hate broccoli. I hate school. I hate swimming. I hate piano. And we would say, you must not hate what God has created and what God has enabled. And if they were ever to say, I hate so-and-so, we would scold them and say, you must not ever hate anyone. You can judge for yourself. I wonder if you think that's good parenting. It kind of confronts, however, with what we hear in, in this text in Psalm 139. Do I not hate those who hate you? And if that's bad enough, David follows it up with, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I imagine a father having a conversation with his son and saying, you must not hate Mikey. And the boy saying to his father, oh, don't worry, Dad, I hate him with a perfect hatred. These are difficult words to hear, difficult words to understand. They're not often preached. This morning I conducted a little survey. I went on sermonaudio.com. I don't know if you're familiar with the website. I host all kinds of sermons, and there were nearly 2,000 sermons on Psalm 139. And of those nearly 2,000 sermons, only 40 of them touched on these verses. That's 2%. Though this part of the psalm accounts for nearly 20% of the psalm, only 2% of the sermons touched on these verses. I'm not wagging my finger at anybody tonight because 
in my ministry, I've preached on Psalm 139 twice, and until today I've never preached on these verses. They're difficult verses to understand, and perhaps as you heard them tonight, you objected. And I've spoken to members in blessings who think these are words that we should not say and words that we should not sing in church. And if that's your position, you're going to find support from some formidable individuals, including C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, who says of, of, of this text and of similar texts, that they're devilish and diabolical. And you're going to find Old Testament scholars who say, well, what we have in these verses is the vulnerability and honesty of the psalmist is raw emotion, but it's not sinless. And the psalmist should be reprimanded for using language like that. And then there are those who say, well, this might be acceptable Old Testament piety, but it's not acceptable New Testament piety, Jesus taught us to love our neighbors. And so this part of Psalm 139 is a sub-Christian text, some have said. Now I will readily concede tonight that there are statements that are made in the Bible that are impious. What the friends of Job, for instance, say to Job is impious. You're not going to use statements made by the friends of Job to Job as proof text for any particular doctrine. But are you prepared tonight to say that there are some statements that we find in the Psalms that are impious? I think if you make that claim, you face a very serious problem. And the problem is that the Psalms are cited in the New Testament, not least by Jesus, freely and frequently, without any hint of embarrassment, without any hint of disapproval, without any word of caution. In fact, even these portions of the psalm, what we call the imprecatory portions, where the psalmist invites down curses on his enemies and on God's enemies, even those are cited at times in the New Testament without any disapproval. So I want you to consider with me tonight the possibility that these are devout words. And I would suggest to you, as, as odd as it might seem, that there is a sense in which we must be godly haters. Godly haters. Sounds like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? And if you're taking notes tonight, to be a godly hater... We must learn first to assess evildoers accurately and then secondly, examine ourselves humbly. To be a godly hater, we must learn to assess evildoers accurately and then examine ourselves humbly. Well, this section begins you could see in verse 19, if only you, God, would slay the wicked. Now, I've been in some of your homes, and I've observed how some of you have Bible texts hanging on your refrigerator and inscribed on plaques hanging on your living room wall. I've yet to see any of you with this verse. If only you, O oh God, would slay the wicked. Wouldn't that be something to walk into somebody's house and see that hanging on the refrigerator? If you're familiar at all with Psalm 139, you're bothered by this statement in what is otherwise a beautiful psalm. In fact, it's so disjointed that you have a lot of Bible scholars who say that some editor later in Israel's history appended this text to the psalm, but it wasn't part of the original psalm. And again, I have no problem with the possibility that on occasion you have an editor who adds something to a psalm at a later point in Israel's history, but if you, if you, if you grant that, you're still left with the problem. Why would an editor <laughs> append this text to this beautiful psalm about God's 
attributes and his perfections. I think we need to do the more difficult work of seeing whether there might in fact be a connection between all that David has said in the first 18 verses and then what he says in verses 19 and following. And I submit to you tonight that there is in fact a connection. And David, you see, has been contemplating the identity of God, and he's been recalling God's characteristics. God is present everywhere, knows everything, is all-powerful, and yet is intimately familiar with the minutia of David's life, knows David intimately and personally. And David, throughout the psalm, you can see this. He's praising God for who he is. And it's as if he's being caught up and love for God. And he wants to take his stand with God. And if he's going to take his stand with God, he's going to take his stand against those who defy God. And that's the first thing that we need to see here, that what David says is born out of his love for God. And those whom he hates are those who hate God. There's little indication in the text that these are David's personal enemies. In fact, if you look at verse 22, he says, I count these people as my enemies. In other words, they're not first and foremost my personal enemies, but because they hate you, O oh God, because they defy you, I count them as my enemies. Now, who exactly are these evildoers? What are they doing? Well, they're bloodthirsty men, the text says. Bloodthirsty people. I don't know. Do you know any bloodthirsty people? I'm almost 50. I've never met a bloodthirsty person. But there are bloodthirsty people in the world. I don't know if you remember what the ISIS soldiers did to their captives. I hope you haven't seen the images or the video. I'm hesitant to describe them out of sensitivity to, to children that we have here and people maybe with weak stomachs, but those ISIS soldiers violently killed their captives without any sense that what they were doing was morally amiss. And I suspect that if one of those people killed by an ISIS soldier was your son or your daughter or your father or your mother, you would probably say, Oh God, slay the wicked and those bloodthirsty people, those who are bloodthirsty. But I've made the point here that David has this emotional reaction not out of love for people, first and foremost, but out of love for God. These aren't simply terrorists and serial killers. These are terrorists and serial killers who explicitly and overtly and publicly hate God and defy him, and that's apparent all the way through the psalm. Verse 20, they speak of you with evil intent. Misuse your name. Verse 21, they hate you. They're in rebellion against you. These are the enemies of God who defy him. And so David prays, if you, if only you, God, would slay the wicked, those who kill with bloodshed. I wonder tonight, are you jealous for the name of God? Does it bother you at all when the name of God is blasphemed? Does it bother you at all when people live without reference to God, without regard for God, when people worship things other than God? I'm struck every time I read this in Acts 17 where Paul goes to Athens and it says when he saw that the city was full of idols, he was greatly distressed. When he saw that the city was full of idols, that people were giving their lives over to things other than God, 
He was greatly distressed. And he says in 1 Corinthians 16, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. And he says, I hate these people with a perfect hatred, and I think we need to admit here that there's imperfect hatred And a variant of wrong hatred would be vindictiveness, personal vindictiveness, revenge. And if you think of the life of David, those of you who are familiar with his life, can you recall a time when David was vindictive? Can you think of how David treated his enemies? Well, you say he killed Goliath, but was that personal vindictiveness? Not at all. Goliath was defying defying the armies of Israel's God. David had no personal enemies against him. And you think of how David treated Saul, who was pursuing him, you know, hunting him like a partridge in the forest. He spared Saul's life. He respected Saul. Can you think of how David dealt with Absalom, his son who who was mutinous, who rebelled against him, who revolted against him. What did he say to Job, his commander? He says, deal gently for my sake with the young man, Absalom. There was no personal vindictiveness on David's part. In fact, throughout the whole Bible, there's no support ever for personal vindictiveness or for revenge. Jesus tells us explicitly not to take revenge, to turn the other cheek. And yet Jesus doesn't discount the principle of vengeance. God is not a moral wimp. And he will mete out judgments in the end. He will punish evildoers. I don't know if you're like me, but I like to watch on TV and Netflix real crime stories. I don't know what that says about me. I'm probably psychologically twisted or something. But what you encounter when you watch real crime stories is the sense that victims have deep within them for justice. They want their offenders to have their day in court. They want their offenders to receive a punishment that fits the crime. I wonder if you think that God is going to just let people off the hook. You think that God is really going to let serial rapists and serial killers off the hook, unpunished, just ignore what they did, pretend it didn't happen? What's God's stance against evildoers? In fact, what you discover is that sometimes the only thing that prevents a victim from being vengeful, from taking revenge, from being vindictive, the only thing sometimes that can prevent a victim from being vengeful is the conviction that one day God will punish the wicked. One day the evildoer will be held to account and will be punished. Now listen to this. This is, this is quite uh, unnerving. I, I remember discovering this some time ago. Uh, this line in Revelation chapter 6, uh, I'd always imagined heaven to be a place of rest and bliss and happiness, and I discovered that it's not always so. Now the new earth that we will inhabit with resurrected bodies is a place of perfect happiness and perfect bliss. That's not true of heaven. And there's a sense in which we will be in heaven and still impatient and still unhappy and still unsatisfied about something. Listen to what the martyred saints cry out from heaven. Revelation 6, verse 10, they called out in a loud voice, martyred saints in heaven, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. 
Isn't that remarkable? Martyred saints in heaven saying, how long is it going to be, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, before you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Make those who put us to death pay for it. Well, you say, how in the world can we reconcile this with what Jesus says about loving our enemies? You have to remember my point that we hate people only insofar as they hate God. And we love them in other ways. We love them as people whom God has created in His image. We love our enemies as those who have inherent value and dignity as human beings. We love our enemies as temples that could potentially be inhabited by the Holy Spirit. We love our enemies as those who can potentially be forgiven and renewed and restored and have all of those heinous crimes forgiven. But we do not love them as bloodthirsty, malicious haters of God. Paul says in Romans, while we were sinners, while we were enemies, God loved us. But you know something? He didn't love our sin. He didn't love our unbelief. He didn't love our refusal to believe him. He hated it. We could say that, can't we? On the basis of what we read in Proverbs 6. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Listen to this list in light of Psalm 139. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stores up conflict, who stirs up conflict in the community. Isn't this what we find in the life of Jesus? Hatred of evil. Isn't this what we see in in the life of Jesus when he overturned the tables of the money changers? Isn't this what we see in the life of Jesus when he upbraided the Pharisees for putting on the shoulders of the people an impossible yoke and neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and love? Isn't this what we hear from Jesus when he scolds the church of Ephesus and then says, but you've done one thing right. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We need to pause here and ask ourselves the question, how do we respond to evil? How do we respond to the incarnation of evil, the manifestation of evil in a person? Do you want evil to coexist with good? Do you want evil to have space in the world? I would hope that all of us tonight would say we, want, we don't want evil to have any space. We want God to triumph over evil. We want God to destroy evil completely. And that, you see, is what we're praying when we pray, your kingdom come. We're praying, destroy the works of the devil and everything that rises up against you, O Lord, and every conspiracy against your holy word. Leave no space in the world for evil. Now let me ask you this question you're opposed to the incarnation of evil in the world. What about the incarnation of evil in yourself? What do you want God to do with the evil in your own life? Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. What do you, do, what do you want done with your sinful nature? You want God to put it to death. You want God to slay it. You want God to crucify it, to mortify it. Well, 
perhaps you wonder how this prayer can be prayed in a missional church. Well, I think you, you need to think of how this prayer might be answered. I think this prayer was answered in the conversion of Saul. You know, Saul was somebody who was persecuting the early Christian church. He was a bloodthirsty person. He was putting people to death. He was consenting to the death of others. And I'm sure there were early Christian believers who were taking the words of Psalm 139 on their lips and saying, Oh Lord, rise up and slay the wicked and put an end to bloodthirsty Saul. And God answered that prayer, but in a surprising way, in the conversion of Saul. When he put to death all of those evil passions of Saul. And we associate this putting to death only with some physical judgment, and for that it will be true of some, but for others it's conversion. The evil in people and the evil in us is put to death by conversion. So to be a, a godly hater, one must assess evildoers accurately. But then secondly and lastly and briefly, we must examine ourselves humbly. It's very interesting that, that David, when he, when he says these words, realizes that he's in danger of, of self-righteousness. So he has these very harsh words about, about the enemies of God and how they should be slain. And then he, it's like he, he backtracks a little bit, doesn't he? And he says these words. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is not a Pharisee praying, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. This is a humble believer saying, Lord, I recognize that I'm just like other men. And Lord, I want you to scrutinize me. I want you to probe me. I want you to put me under the microscope. I want you to expose whatever might be evil in my life. Please, God, show me if there's any maliciousness, any unfounded hatred in my life. Expose it so that I might put it to death. Jesus, of course, taught, you know, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, you've got to remove the plank from your own. And David says, search me. It's a little bit like the other petition in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. David is praying, deliver us from, deliver me from evil. Lead me not into temptation. And it's a prayer, you see, that was answered by Jesus on the cross, where Jesus dealt very de definitively with evil. He stepped on the head of the serpent. He triumphed, Paul says, over powers and principalities. 1 John 3 the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. But has Jesus done that definitively in your life? Or do you find yourself governed by evil impulses? Well, if that's the case, you've got to go to Jesus. And you've got to say, Jesus, put to death the evil in me, so it no longer exerts power over me. And what's Jesus going to do to you? If you go to him with that prayer, Jesus put to death the evil in me. 
One of the things I did over my break was I read through the Synoptic Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you find people going to Jesus from all over. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, heal me. Lord, heal my son. Lord, heal my daughter. People coming from all over throughout his entire life. And I counted the number of times where Jesus didn't do anything. I counted the number of times where Jesus chose not to help a person. I counted the number of times where Jesus ignored the request of a person who had a sick son or a sick daughter, and they were zero. Every time someone went to Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy, help me, heal me, Jesus helped and Jesus healed. Do you really think you're going to be the first person that Jesus doesn't help or heal? If you go to Jesus sincerely, I can guarantee you, you will be helped, you will be healed. We need to learn to be godly haters, to hate, to hate people insofar as they hate God. Not people as such, but people insofar as they hate God. People insofar as they are abusers. People insofar as they are bloodthirsty. People insofar as they sabotage God's good creation. But let's never say things like that without looking at ourselves and saying to God, probe me. See if there's any grievous way in me. Expose it. So that it might be put to death. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who destroys the works of the devil, that you are the destroyer of evil, that you destroyed evil personified in the devil but we need you to destroy evil in our own lives. We need you to subdue evil impulses within us, evil dispositions that sometimes govern us in a way that they shouldn't. We need you to put these impulses to death. And we pray tonight after hearing a hard word, that we would see you as the gentle Savior who extends this gracious invitation that if we are weary from fighting, if we are heavy laden from the burdens of this world, we can go to you, you who are gentle and meek, and you will give us rest and rescue and deliverance freedom. We thank you for that, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.